Dear Heavenly Father, we're coming to you in the name of Jesus. We want to just thank you, Lord God, for allowing us to come together. Your Sabbath day, Lord God. The day you said to have a holy convocation so we can learn more about you. And as your word goes forth, Heavenly Father, give us understanding, Lord God. Not just understand your word, Heavenly Father, but also to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. <clears throat> the title of today's lesson is Paul, the most misunderstood apostle in the Bible. Paul, the most misunderstood apostle in the Bible. Like I said, as we do every Sabbath day, we're going to read Psalms 119, 165 to 176, and I'll go more in depth about the title. Psalms 119, 165 to 176. It says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Lord, I have hope for thy salvation, and done thy commandments. My soul hath kept thy testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I have kept thy precepts and thy testimonies, for all my ways are before thee. Let my cry come near before thee, O Lord. Give me understanding according to thy word. Let my supplications come before thee. Deliver me according to thy word. My lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statutes. My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Let thy hand help me, for I have chosen thy precepts. I have longed for thy salvation, O Lord, and the law is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise thee. And let thy judgments help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. Amen. So like I said, going with the title again, Paul, the most misunderstood apostle in the Bible. See, a lot of times people, you know, especially, you know, Roman Christianity, they love to run to Paul's epistles and try to say how Paul was teaching against the commandments of God and how he believes that Jesus came with new commandments and Paul was teaching, you know, commandments of Christ instead of the commandments of God or the laws of Moses. Not understanding that Jesus was the one who gave the laws to Moses. And he said that, you know, in, Deut in Deuteronomy 4 and 2, he says we cannot add or take away from God's commandments. But everyone loves to run to Paul to try to pretty much usurp and circumvent everything that God said in the Old Testament. So we're going to read and see, was Paul an actual law keeper and a keeper and a teacher of the law? Or was he the opposite? So we're going to figure out during this lesson. So now we're going to go ahead and start this off in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, we're going to read 8 through 15. <coughs> Acts chapter 6, 8 through 15. Acts chapter 6, 8 through 15. Acts, Acts chapter 6, 8 through 15. And when you get there, go ahead. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, mm -hmm. and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia, mm -hmm. and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. Mm. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit. By which he spake. Because remember, he was full of the Holy Ghost as well, so he was full of the Word of God. So when these people were trying to come at him, see, these, so these were the so-called Jews that were in these places, in the synagogues. I'm sure Stephen was preaching Christ to them, and they were rejecting him, so that's why they couldn't. That's why they said that, uh, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spake. But go ahead. But look what they did, though. Then they suburn uh, men. And that means, suburn means to secretly persuade it. So they secretly persuaded, persuaded men to do what? Which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Mm -hmm. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. So remember, they're lying on him now, saying that what? Go ahead. Because they're setting up false witnesses right here. You're going to see it. Go ahead. And set up false witnesses, which said, this man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. Mm -hmm. For we have heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, shall destroy this place and shall change the custom which Moses delivered us. Mm. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Amen. So you see in verse 14, they lie. So it says, look, for we have heard him say, which they didn't, that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered unto us. Because remember, Jesus did not change anything of the law. Because remember, when Jesus started out his ministry, 
when he started out his ministry, first thing he said was this. In Matthew 5, 17, it says, Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever shall teach, whoever shall do, shall do and teach them, the same shall be great in the kingdom of heaven. So that's what, so he's letting you know Jesus did not change the, uh, the laws that he gave to Moses, so they were lying on him. So now let's go, let's go to the next chapter. We're going to read Acts 7, 51 through 60. Acts 7, 51 through 60, because see, Stephen was calling out these Pharisees, because actually the Pharisees were the ones who weren't actually keeping the laws. We're going to see that right here. Go ahead. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so did he. So you said, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Now, they were circumcised in the flesh, but that doesn't mean anything because just because if you're circumcised in the flesh and if your heart is circumcised, that circumcision means nothing. That's why he says in, um, in, Romans, in Romans chapter 2, verse, uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 25 says, For circumcision barely profit, if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. So even though these, even though these Pharisees were circumcised in the flesh, their heart was circumcised because they were a breaker of the law. So pretty much, God still saw them as uncircumcised because they weren't keeping the commandments of God, as we're going to read right here. Verse 52. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? Mm -hmm. And they have slain them which showed before of the, com of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Right, see, they didn't, they didn't keep the law, but go ahead. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, mm. and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Yes. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, right. went up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the, let's see, uh, standing on the right hand of God. Mm -hmm. And they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. Mm. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. This is actually Paul, same person. Go ahead. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He went to heaven? He oh, he fell asleep. I thought he went to heaven. I thought. He, I, so wait, Steve is not up in heaven smiling down at us, saying, "You know, oh, he's not." Oh, he, <laughs> right, exactly. He fell asleep. Yeah, he come on, come on, come on. Okay, now let's go and go to let's go to Acts chapter eight, very next chapter. Acts chapter eight. We're gonna read one through three. Acts chapter eight, verses one through three. Can we get there? Go ahead. And Saul was consenting unto his death, mm -hmm. and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the region, um, at, at the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Mm -hmm. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, mm. entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Right, so see, that's, this, this is what Saul was doing. So now let's go to the very next chapter, uh, Acts chapter 9. We're going to read one through, verses 1 through 16. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 16. Because see, now we're going to see uh, Saul's conversion, where he's going to become Saul. Well, he, he'll no longer be Saul. He'll become Paul right here. But go ahead. When you get there, go ahead. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogue that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? 
And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, as it, no, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. So when he says that, he says, when he said, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks, it's not found in the oldest Greek text. He said, however, he says, Saul was hurting, was only hurting himself in the actions because he was rebelling against God. Saul thought that he was pursuing heretics, but he was persecuting Jesus himself. Anyone who persecutes believers today is also guilty of persecuting Jesus. You know, you can read that in Matthew 25, because believers are the bodies of Christ on the earth. But go ahead. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Mm -hmm. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no men. Mm. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. Mm. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Mm -hmm. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight. And inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. Mm -hmm. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen a, in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Mm. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. Right, so he's kind of reluctant. Even though he's hearing from the Lord, he said, Lord, but you know about Paul. Mm -hmm. Well, Saul, he out here persecuting the church and all like that. But what did he say? And here he had authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Well, look what he going to say. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me mm -hmm. to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, mm -hmm. for I will show him how great things he must suffer in my name, for my name's sake. Right, so you see that, so he says, verse 15, but the Lord says to him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the who? Gentiles, Gentiles right, because mm -hmm. remember, he sent the apostles, the 12 apostles were sent to the children of Israel. I mean, you can read that in Matthew chapter uh, 10, verse 5, where he says, Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, where it says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, into any city of Samaritans. Enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So God already had the twelve apostles to go into the, to the, to the Israelites, but now uh, Christ raised up Paul so that he can be apostle to the Gentiles. We're going to go and read that. Let's go to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, one verse, verse 13. Romans chapter 11, verse 1, uh, verse 13. Romans chapter 11, verse 13. Romans chapter 11, verse 13. One verse. When we get there, go ahead. Romans chapter 11, verse 13. Go ahead. For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify... My amen, amen. So now let's go and go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. Can we get there? Go ahead. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle. And the teacher of the Gentiles. Right. So remember, so that's why we, we, that's why a lot of times when we read his epistles, they're kind of hard to be understood because he's writing to Gentiles who never had the law. However, when you read Paul's writings in the book of Hebrews, he clearly lets you know he's writing to Israelites who know the law. He's constantly letting them know that they have to keep the law. So that's why it's important and imperative to go to the book of Acts to see Paul's journey through the book of Acts to show that he was a law keeper and he was a teacher of the law. But instead, people run to his epistles, and Peter's going to explain to us later on in this lesson that his writings can be hard to be uh, understood for those that are unlearned. So now let's go and go to Acts 21. Now we're going to go journey through the life of Paul and see was Paul a law keeper and a teacher of the law. Acts 21, 
Acts 21, we're going to read 15 through 40. Acts 21, 15 through 40. And we're going to see by the end of this lesson, was Paul a law keeper or was he a teacher against the law? We're going to see. It's going to be very, it's going to be adamantly clear that he was clearly a law keeper and a law teacher. Acts 21, verse 15. When you get there, go ahead. And after those days, we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. There went with us also certain of the disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one Manassan mm -hmm. of, of Cyprus, an old disciple with whom we should lodge. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Mm -hmm. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. Mm, remember, he was a what? Apostle to who? The Gentiles. So he was letting them know how, how the Gentiles were receiving salvation and things like that and receiving the Lord through his ministry. Watch this, though. Look at 20. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are that believe. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And they are all zealous of the law. So look at that. So look at it. He says, so thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews, he says, which are which believe, who they believe in Christ, believe in Jesus, and they are all zealous of the law. So why aren't they saying, you know what, you know, we don't have to keep the law anymore. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, we're under Christ. We don't have to no longer keep the laws of Moses. But look what they're going to say. Because remember, it's been rumored about Paul. The same way the rumors are about Paul now, about him teaching against the law, it was also heard back then about him. Now look what they say, verse 21. And they are informed of thee, that thou teachest all mm -hmm. the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, mm. saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Mm. What is it therefore? The multitudes must needs come together, yes. for they will hear that thou art. So they look, hey man, everyone know that you're coming, Paul. So they're hearing that you come, and they all saying that you're telling people that they don't have to be circumcised and no longer keep the laws of Moses. So they're going to give him, they're going to tell him whether he has to take a Nazarite vow to prove that he kept the law and taught the law of Moses. He's going to do it right here. Go ahead, verse 23. Do, do therefore this, do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Right, and you can find this vow written in um, Numbers chapter 6. It's called the Nazarite vow. He's going to do what? Then take and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them. You are, and pay it too, right? And pay this vow for them. Mm -hmm. That they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things were of, they were informed concerning thee are nothing. All right, are nothing. That's not true. Mm-hmm. But that thou thyself also walkest orderly mm -hmm. and keepest the law right. as touching the Gentiles which believe. We have written and concluded that they observe no such thing save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols right. and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. Right, that's true because remember when, when you read in Acts chapter 15, this is the Jerusalem Council, they were trying to figure out what to do with the Gentiles because they were... Because, you know, remember, the Jews were trying to have the Gentiles keep the whole entire law of Moses right then and there and be circumcised. And they were like, nah, that's too much to put on the Gentiles who are just coming into the faith. So what they did was they gave the Gentiles four commandments. And then that's why it says it right here in Acts 15. In Acts 15 where, where he says this. Um, Acts 15 verse 19 says, Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles who are turned to God, that we write unto them that they abstain from pollution of idols, from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So he's trying to say, look, so when these Gentiles, you know, are coming to Sabbath service and hearing the word of God, even though we're giving these four commandments, the more they, the more they hear more, the word of God, they'll eventually start doing things that's contained in the word of God. However, don't try to put this burden onto them at once when they're just coming into the faith. And that's all that the Gentiles, but remember, the Gentiles still have to keep the law. It was just that they had a grace period because the Jews, they were raised in it. You know what I'm saying? So there, there was no excuse for them. That's why when you read in the book of Acts, the very next chapter, Timothy was, a, he, he was also a Gentile, but yet he got circumcised because he was raised in the truth. He was raised in the faith. 
He should have been circumcised already. He wasn't a newly converted Gentile. So that's why he got circumcised. But just keep reading. Oh, verse 26 now. Verse 26. Go ahead. Then Paul took the hands and the next day purified himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification. Right. So he was about to do the, um, the, the complete, but what happened? But see, like I said, they're going to tell you right here, verse 27. Go ahead. Until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, mm -hmm. when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid his hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help. This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law in this place mm -hmm. and further brought Greeks also into the temple and have polluted this holy place. You see, now they're lying on Paul, though. See, they're lying on him. He didn't. He never said that. See, he never, remember, he was taking a Nazarite vow to prove he, he kept and taught the law, but people are lying on him saying that he wasn't doing that. But go ahead. For they had seen before with him in the city, uh, Trophimus mm -hmm. and Ephesians, for they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. They, they supposed, but he did it. Cause you know, you couldn't bring nobody uncircumcised in the temple. You know what I'm saying? That's, he never did that. I was alive, but go ahead. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together. And they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. Yes. And as they ran, and as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band, and all Jerusalem was in an uproar. Yes. Who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captains and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. Mm. And the chief captain, let's see, they, the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was mm -hmm. and what he had done. And, the, and some cried one thing and some another among the multitude. And when he could not know the certainty for the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. Mm. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people, for the multitude of the people followed after crying away with him. Right, now he's about to speak to the crowd. Now go ahead. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Mm -hmm. Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Mm -hmm. Art not thou that Egyptian, which before these days made us an uproar and led us out into the wilderness 4,000 men that were murderers? Right. So when he asked them, he says, Art thou an Egyptian? Why would he ask him, are, are you that Egyptian? Because, you know, Egyptians were black. Not, these, not those images that you see right now, those images, because, you know, a lot of times... They're trying to make Egyptians look almost white now. You know what I'm saying? But obviously they weren't. You remember the Egyptians didn't get kicked out until around 680 AD when, they, when God put them in the land of Pathros because when they enslaved our people. You can read that in uh, Ezekiel chapter 29. However, they thought Paul was an Egyptian because he was a black man. You know what I'm saying? Like that. But that's, that's another story. But look at verse 39 though. But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city of Salem. Mm -hmm. Citizen of no mean city. Yes. And I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto him in the Hebrew tongue. Right, so he's saying, right, so he's first speaking in Hebrew. We're gonna go to the very next chapter, verses one through twenty two. Go ahead. Men, brethren and fathers. Hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence, and he said, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of uh, Gam 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 Gamaliel. Yeah, I'll give you up. You good. And taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God and ye all this day. See, see, look at that though. And ye brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according, see look, uh, to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, right? Not of the prophets, of his father because these are the Pharisees, the Pharisees and was zealous toward God 
as ye all are his, uh, this day. Now look at this. Um, just real quick, I'm going to go to uh, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to read verse 5. Philippians chapter 3, verse 5, where he makes this statement. He says, well, I'm going to start at verse 4. Though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews as touching the law, see, a Pharisee, and concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteous which is of the law, blameless. But you see, he was letting you know that he was a Pharisee. And when you go to Galatians chapter 1, Paul was teaching against that now. That's why in Galatians chapter 1 verse 13 where he says, For ye have heard in my conversation or lifestyle in, the past, in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my father. See, he was, he was following the customs of the Pharisees, you know what I'm saying, not of the prophets. So that's why when it says right here in, in Acts chapter 22, verse 3, where it says, I am verily a man which am a Jew born in Tarsus in the city of Caesarea, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers. They were teaching that he was a Pharisee. They weren't following the doctrine of God because that's why Christ kept telling them the Pharisees weren't teaching. Now you can read Matthew chapter 23. He breaks that down how the Pharisees were hypocrites. But go ahead, verse 4. And I persecuted women and also the high priest of bearing me witness and all the estate of the elders. Mm -hmm. from whom also I received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. Yes. And it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me, and I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Yes. And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecuted. Mm -hmm. And they that were with me saw indeed the light, and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of whom of him that spake to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. Mm -hmm. And when I could see, not see for the glory of that light being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. Yes. And one Ananias, devout man, a devout man according to the law. According to the what? According to the law. Okay. Having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him, mm. and he said, The God of our fathers have chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. Mm. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard, and now there now tarries thou. Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Mm. And it came to pass that when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And mm. I saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. Right, so Jesus is telling her to get up out of Jerusalem because they're going to try to kill him. But go ahead, watch this. 2019. And I said, Lord, they know I am prison." that I imprison and beat every synagogue, beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. Mm -hmm. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. This is close. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. Unto the where? The Gentiles. He goes send him away. You know what I'm saying? Because he was in Jerusalem. That's why he said, Look, I'm going to send you out of here because you, know, you need to sp uh, spread my gospel to these Gentiles because he already had the 12 apostles to spread the gospel to the, uh, the people in Jerusalem and, and, and around Israel. But go ahead. 
and they gave him audience unto this word, and then lifted up their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. Right, so they want to try to kill him. They want to try to kill him. So let's go to the very next chapter, Acts 23. We're going to read 12 through 30. Acts chapter, Acts chapter 23, 12 through 30. When you get there, go ahead. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse. Uh oh. So look what he said. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a what? Curse. Saying what? Saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Well, they ate. Hey, well, you know they died. They put they said because because Paul got away. We're gonna read that. Go ahead. And they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. Mm, so 40 folks died. Go ahead. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, that said, we have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Mm -hmm. Now therefore, ye with the counsel signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow mm. as though ye would inquire something more perfect, more perfectly concerning him. And we, or ever he come near, are ready to kill him. Mm. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. Mm. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. Mm. So he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee, who have something to say unto thee. Mm -hmm. Then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, What is that thou hast to tell me? said, the Jews have agreed to desire thee, that thou wouldest bring down Paul tomorrow into the council, as though they would inquire some, let's see, somewhat of him more perfectly. Mm -hmm. But do not thou yield unto them, for there lie in wait for him of them more than forty men which have bound themselves with an oath, yes. that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. Mm -hmm. And now they are are they ready looking for a promise from thee. Mm -hmm. So the chief captain then let the young man depart and charge him. See thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things to me. Right. So go ahead. Mm hmm and he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready 200 soldiers. Right, they said, okay, they got 40. Okay, we're going to have 200 soldiers to what? <laughs> to go to Caesarea. To mm -hmm. go to Caesarea and horsemen, three score and ten, and spearmen 200 mm. at the third hour of the night. So they were definitely ready just in case they try to come up against them. Go ahead. And provide them beasts that they may set Paul on mm. and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. Yes. And he wrote a letter after this manner, Claudius, Lysias, unto the most excellent governor, Felix, sent a greeting. Yes. This man was taken of the Jews and should have been killed of them. Mm -hmm. Then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. And when I, ha and when I would have known the cause wherefore, they accused him. I brought him forth into their council, yes. whom I perceived to be accused of questions of their law. But I, but to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or bond. Right, cause, yeah, because they said that they felt that wasn't worthy of death of Paul because, one, they were lying on him. So what did he say in verse 30? And when it was told me how that the Jews <laughs> laid wait for the man, I sent straight way to thee and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they had against him farewell. Right, so he was able to get away. So trust me, that could, hey, they never ate, they never drank, so you know that those 40 men died because yeah, they didn't get a chance to kill Paul. Hey, Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, so this 
says in, uh, what's this, uh, verse 27, I haven't understood that he was a Roman, so Paul was essentially a Roman citizen, though? Yes, yeah, remember, he was a Roman citizen, but he was still, a, it's just like us, we're Israelites, but we're American no, citizens. No, no, I'm gonna, yeah, I understand that, but I just want to make sure that he was a, officially a citizen of Rome. Yes, he was, yeah, he was from Tarsus, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah, but I know he's Israelite, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was, yeah, yeah, so that's why he was able to have that protection from them. Because if he wasn't a citizen, then he would have been, he wouldn't have had that protection from 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 them to, to, to bring to Caesarea. So this is since by him being a Roman, he had that protection under the jurisdiction. So that's how they was able to send all those men to protect Paul, because he was a Roman right, citizen. Right. Exactly. Just like just like us, if we're overseas, and, you know, there you go. We have like the U.S. embassy. There you go. There Amen. And, that's exactly uh, it. Like that. Amen. That's exactly good. Ex ex example. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Yep. That's it. So now we're going to go away. We're in Acts, uh, okay, Acts 24 now. Very next chapter, Acts 24, 1 through 16. Acts 24, 1 through 16. Go ahead. And after five days, Ananias the priest descended with the, soldier, with the elders and with a certain order named Tertullus, mm -hmm. who informed the governor against Paul. And when he was called for Tertullus, began to... <coughs> Accuse him, saying, "Seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence, we accept it always, and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness, notwithstanding that I be not further tedious unto thee." I pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of thy clemency a few words. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow. Mm -hmm. And and let's see, a and mover move, yeah. mm -hmm. of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world. And a ringleader of the sect of the Nazareth. Remember, he was with the second of, remember, Jesus was from Nazareth. So he was like the, you know what I'm saying? So they were called Nazarenes. They weren't, like I said, some say Christians, but then also they were also called Nazarenes as well. But go ahead. Who also have gone about to profane the temple. Who And they lied on him. Go ahead. And we took and would have judged according to our law. Mm -hmm. But the chief captain, Lysias, yep. came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands commanding his accusers to come unto thee by examining of whom thyself mayest take knowledge of all these things whereof we accuse him. Mm -hmm. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. So so, the, so you know that they're lying, right? That's why um, when you're going to see right here, he's going to say, look, let me speak for myself because these people were constantly lying on Paul saying that he was telling folks he was, he was raising seditions in the quarters and telling people not to keep the law. But look what he's going to say right here, out of Paul's own mouth. This is how you know Paul was a law keeper and a law teacher. Go ahead, verse 10. Then Paul, after the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many, of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, right. neither raising up the people, mm -hmm. neither in the synagogues nor in the city. Right. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, yes. so worship I, so worship I, the God of my fathers, believe in all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. See, so he letting you know. So he was letting you know. So he, he, he believes and he was teaching all things that were written in the law and in the prophets. And what law was that? Acts, 20, Acts 28 and 3. I'm sorry, Acts 28 and 23, let you know what law, what Paul was, what he was teaching, and what law was it from? Acts uh, 28 and 23. 
where it says, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and not of the prophets, from morning till evening. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. So the law that he's right. So when he said he believed the, um, so in verse um, 14 where it says, But I confess unto thee that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I, the God of my father, believe in all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there should be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. Go 16, go ahead. Oh, that was it? Okay, okay, that was it. Oh, verse 16. Verse 16. Oh. And, and, herein, uh -huh. and herein do I exercise myself to have always conscious void of offense toward God and toward me. Right, so he's like, you know, so by him preaching the gospel, he always had a clear conscience towards God and towards man because he's teaching the true, unadulterated word of God. So now let's go ahead and go by because, you know, people try to say Paul said that you can eat anything you want, but just pray over it. Well, let's see how Paul felt about the dietary law. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4. I'm sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'm sorry, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. So as we spread, we see that Paul was a law keeper. And that's why I always try to tell people when you stick with the book of Acts about Paul's life, don't try to go to his epistles and try to say that he said, He's no longer teaching against the law of Moses anymore, or that, he, that he's teaching against the law of Moses when he clearly was about to take a Nazarite vow before he got interrupted and they started lying on him. So that'll let you know right then and there he was definitely a law keeper and a law teacher. 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 through 5. Go ahead. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and yes. doctrines of devils, speaking lies of hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidden to marry, yes. and commanded to abstain from meats, yes. which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Mm -hmm. For every creature of God is good, yes. and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Amen. So you see that. So... When, 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 you, when they read verse uh, 1, it says, Now the Spirit speaking expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanded to abstain from meats, which God had created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth, which is the word of God. So that's why I asked you, I said, are you saying that, that, um, that God's dietary law is a doctrine of devils? Because when we're saying that you have to keep the dietary law, are you calling God's commandments the doctrines of devil? And they get kind of, you know, bewildered. bewildered and, they, and now they find themselves in a conundrum because they're like, whoa, hold up. And then you have to realize what was he talking about in the latter times. We're going to see this in history. In history on how I'm going to go to the last two million years. Last two million years. Page 217. Last two million years, page 217, because it says that speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience sealed with a hot iron, see they're forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. So we're going to see who did that, though. It's the Roman Catholic Church. Um, just read this right here. Pope, this is in 520. This is Pope Benedict right here, 529 AD. What does the book say? Go ahead. In 529, Benedict drew up. No, regular, uh -huh. which was gradually adopted by most monasteries in the West. Yes. The regular required the monks to take vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience in their monasteries, was organized as a family under the abbot. The word comes from the Greek abbot, meaning father. Like life in six and seven century monasteries was severe but not harsh, being divided between sleeping, working, and praying. The monks had a pound of bread, two cooked dishes, and a measure of wine each day, though eating meat was forbidden. Oh, though eating meat was forbidden, and they had to take a vow of chastity, which means you couldn't marry. So this is the doctrine that Paul was warning about how the Roman Catholic Church was going to forbid people to marry and how they couldn't eat meat. 
And you see that. that that's right there, the monastery. They did that around 529 A.D. So that was the latter time for when Paul was writing this around 60 so A.D. So five, about 500 something years later, showing how this thing came into fruition. So, and you remember even the Roman Catholic Church even having to where you couldn't even eat meat on Fridays unless you, ate, unless you had fish. So that's what you know. That was established by the Roman Catholic Church. But look, read, now we're going to read, now we're going to go to Genesis. Remember he said that, um, verse 4, for every creature of God is good. And let's go read that. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. I'm sorry, wait. Genesis chapter 1, 20 through 25. 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 When we get there, go ahead. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly, the moving creature that have life, yes. and fowl that may fly above the earth and the open firmament of heaven. Yes. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. God saw that it was what? God saw that it was good. Okay. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. Yes. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Mm -hmm. and, and God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Amen, amen. So now let's go ahead and go back to 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to go back to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. But look at verse 4 again. It says, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified, which means set apart by the word of God and prayer. And what word of God was it set apart in? Deuteronomy chapter 14 and Leviticus chapter 11 because that was the dietary law. So now when we have our food, we, 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 we pray of our food and we ask the Lord to bless our food. That is clean food though. It has to be clean food, nothing unclean. So as you see, so now look at verse 6. 1 Timothy 4 verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. One verse, what the book say? If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou, should, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Right, so he's telling Timothy, if thou puttest the brethren in remembrance of these things, like, remember, mind the brethren of these things, that thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, Nourish up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So he said, of good doctrine. So what is good doctrine according to the word of God? Let's go to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 2. 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 Chapter 4, verse 2. We're going to see what is good doctrine according to God, not man's opinion. Proverbs 4 and 2, what the book say? For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. Exactly. That's good doctrine, not forsaking his law, because that's where we're supposed to live by, and supposed to attain by, by having faith in Jesus Christ. We have to be obedient to what God told us to do. So why would he sit there and try to say God gave a dietary law? So as you're reading in context, now we understand Paul wasn't saying you can eat anything that you want. You know what I'm saying? Because he said, because if he said that, remember he said, for every creature of God is good. So if you think that you can eat every creature, are you saying that, that's why I asked them, I said, can, can we eat people? You know what I'm saying? They were like, what? No, we can't eat people. I said, well, the Bible says this. In, um, in, Mark, in Mark chapter 15. Or is it 16? Let's see, let's see Mark. I think Mark, Mark 16. Because in Mark chapter 16, he says this. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, he says, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world, preaching the gospel to every creature. You know what I'm saying? Like that. So we understand, are, are we going to, so when he says every creature, so are you saying that for every creature of God is good? Can we eat a human? Of course not. So does, does God want us to go and preach the gospel also to, 
to dogs and cats and lions? Of course not. So when he says to preach the gospel to every creature, talk about to every human. You know what I'm saying? Like that. So we understand that. So Paul was not saying that we can eat anything we want and just pray over it. He was clearly know that we had to abide by the dietary law, but he pointed out that religion of the Roman Catholic Church that was coming in the latter days, which was like 500 something years after when Paul wrote that epistle, letting them know that they couldn't marry and how they could, and they had to abstain from meat. So that's so he exposed that. So now we're going to deal about the Sabbath because you know people try to say how Paul was, you know, Paul was preaching upon the first day of the week, which is Sunday. They, they no longer kept the Sabbath. Well, let's go ahead and read that. Let's go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. We're going to read 5 through 7. Acts chapter 20, 5 through 7. Because they want to say, Paul said we can eat anything we want. They say, Paul said we don't have to worry about keeping the Sabbath day anymore. Well, let's see if that's the case. Acts chapter 20. We're going to read 5 through 7. Acts chapter 20, 5 through 7. Acts chapter 20, 5 through 7. And when you get there, go ahead. These going before tarry for us at Troas. Yes. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And we came unto them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. So see, people would forget this part that Paul is keeping the, the Passover in the, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He's keeping the feast, you know what I'm saying? But they overlooked that part, and they just run to verse 7. What does it say? And upon the first day of the week, when the sep and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. See, brother, see, this is why this is why the church keeps Sunday, because it says upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to what? Not to have a holy conference, just breaking bread. That just means to eat. So this is like like Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. Whatever night, and we're breaking bread, and I'm out. If I'm preaching, that does not that does not mean that the Sabbath didn't change to the second or third day of the week. No, it just says that upon the first day of the week on Sunday, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to the mark, ready to depart on the morrow, because he was leaving tomorrow. So he preached and continued until midnight, because he knew he was leaving tomorrow. That's all that was. He just preached. They were eating. He was he was preaching to them, and they were eating, and he was leaving tomorrow at midnight. You know what I'm That's why he preached to midnight. That's all it was. They don't say that the, the Sabbath was changed to the first day of the week. Remember, they broke bread every day. We're going to read that. Let's go to Acts uh, chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, 42 through 46. They broke bread every day, not just on Sunday. Acts chapter 2, 42 through 46. Acts chapter 2, 42 through 46. And we get there, go ahead. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Yes. And fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayer. Yes. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things commanded. In common, uh huh. Go ahead. And all things, oh, I'm sorry. And all things in common, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. And sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to. All men, as every man had need. Yes. And they continuing daily with one accord in the in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Amen. Amen. So you see that. So they broke bread every day. Well, they want to take that one verse, Acts 20 and 7, and try to say, see, the church started uh, having service on Sunday now. Oh, that one little verse now. So now, and then they use this one as well. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. These are the only two verses that they're going to come up with to try to justify Sunday worship, which cannot be done. It can't, especially when you have some understanding of the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4. They use this passage right here to try to justify Sunday worship. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4. When you get there, go ahead. Now concerning the collection for the saints, yes. as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Yes. On the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him. That there be no gatherings when I come. Yes. And when I come, whosoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberality unto... 
to in Jerusalem. Yes. And if it be me that I go also, they shall go with me. Right. So you see that. So that's why he says, verse 16, I mean, verse 1. Now concerning the collections for the, church, for the saints, as I have given order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, and God hath prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. So here it is. So if Paul gets there, so he, he's telling folks, gap. well, they know they could have done they couldn't have done that on a Sabbath day because you're not supposed to do any labor, do any work. So he said, look, not on Sabbath day, but on Sunday, which you could do that, just gather up your things. So when I get there either Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever day I get there next week, you don't try to say, hold up, let me go ahead and get my stuff ready. It should have already been ready on Sunday. So when I got there, so when Paul got there Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it was already ready. You know, it's like, say, for example, you about to get picked up, say, say you got to be somewhere by 7 o'clock and someone comes to your house by 6 o'clock so that they can go ahead because say the journey is about maybe 30, 40 minutes away. Give me time to get there. You come there, you come to someone's house at 6 o'clock. You say, oh, let me go ahead and hop in the shower real quick and then put my clothes on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I told y'all I was going to be there by 6 o'clock so that we can leave. Not for you to start getting ready at 6. Same thing with this. So that's all he was telling them. You know what I'm saying? Just to have this stuff ready on the first day of the week. Because we're going to show and prove that in, remember, this, this is the book of Corinthians. We're going to see what day were they keeping a uh, 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 service or worship on? On what day in, in the Corinthians? Let's go read it right now. Let's go to Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. This is why it's important to, to, to study the book of Acts because when they go to the book of Acts, they can't, people, these false teachers can't, can't deter you and try to say what Paul was doing because the life, especially like from the book of Acts from chapter 9 to, Act, to uh, chapter 28, that's pretty much uh, Paul's um, life journey through him going to these churches. So we're going to see what day were they fellowshipping on in, in, uh, in Corinth. Acts 18, 1 through 4. Go ahead. Acts 8, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, Acts 18, 1 through 4. Go ahead. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. And came where? To Corinth. They're in Corinth now. They're in Corinth. Go ahead. And found a certain Jew named Aquila, born of Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla. Yes. Because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought. Mm -hmm. For by their occupation they were tent makers. Mm. And he reasoned in the synagogue, synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Now read re re verse 11. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Yeah, and that's like 78 Sabbaths. You can count. That's, that's 78 Sabbaths for a year and a half. That what he was, what was he doing? Verse 4, and he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and Greeks. So you see that he was in Corinth and they were having service on the Sabbath, not on Sunday, on the Sabbath as, it, as the Bible clearly states. So now let's go ahead and go to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. One verse. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14. What the book say? Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot. Right, so keep your keep your finger here because we're, we're going to go to Luke one uh, and read chapter of uh, uh, Luke chapter one, read verses five and six, and we're going to come right back to Second Peter chapter three. So keep your finger here. Let's go to Luke one five six because he says, "Wherefore, beloved, seeing that that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless." So how are we found blameless according to God, not man's opinion, but according to God? John the Baptist parents on example. Luke chapter 1, we're going to read 5 and 6. How were they blameless toward God? Luke 1, 5 and 6. What the book say? There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, yes. a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron. Mm -hmm. And her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Blameless, see? And that's what Peter was saying, like, in order for us to be without spot or blameless for the Lord, we got to walk in these commandments so that we can be blameless according to God. 
Now let's go, let's go back to 2 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to read 15 through 18. We're going to read 15 through 18 because a lot of people love to go to Paul's epistles and twist up his epistles to pro uh, promote lawlessness, which is contrary to the word of God. Look at verse 15. What did the book say? An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, mm -hmm. even as our beloved brother, Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, have written unto you. Yes. As also in all his epistles speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. Yes. Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. Yes, they twist. Mm-hmm. As they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Right. So not only are they a twist in Paul's epistle, but they also be, uh, like I said, twisting the scriptures of the apostles. I mean, of the prophets. But look what he says right here. So now, now that we know, he says that we, now that we know that Paul was a law keeper and a law teacher. Look what he says in verse seventeen. This is real key. What does it say? Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also. Oh. Right, yeah, your own stability. So he's saying, look, so now that you know that Paul's letters are hard to be understood, but you do know that he is a law keeper and a law teacher, because he would not have called him his brother. He says, since you know these, he said, he says, yet, yeah, therefore, beloved, seeing you know that these things before, he said, look, I've already warned you, beware lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. But what does he say right here? 18. But growing great. Yes. Mm -hmm. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Right, so praise God. So so we're also convinced we were taught the same things that Paul was thinking that maybe we didn't have to keep the law anymore. But now that we're growing in grace in the Lord and in the knowledge, we're growing in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we understand Paul was not teaching against the law, that he was actually a lawkeeper, especially when you're reading through the book of Acts. This is the last one. First Corinthians uh, chapter eleven, verse one. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. One verse, last one. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And what the book say? 1 Corinthians 11, what? Yeah, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. One verse. Okay. Yeah, it's last one. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. What the book say? Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Right, exactly. So Paul could not have been a follower of Christ, who Christ was a law keeper. He also, remember, Christ is the one that gave the laws to Moses, and he showed us on how to live and walk out the Torah and how to live it. So if he says, be followers of me, even as I am of Christ, that means that Paul had to be a law keeper and a law teacher. So contrary to popular belief, as the title says, Paul, the most misunderstood apostle in the Bible, we see that he was a law teacher and a law keeper, but instead people were running to his epistles to promote lawlessness to their own destruction, and we've already been warned. So when you when you study to show yourself approved, we see that Paul was a law keeper and a law teacher. So hope you got some understanding in Jesus' name. Amen.